Hi, welcome back. My name is Attila Börötz. This is the eighth lesson in our solar energy course. In the previous chapters, we learned about the sun, the sunlight, the effects, the history of using the solar energy. In the last videos, we saw how can we convert solar energy to heat energy, and my colleague was talking about how can we convert solar energy into electricity. We will proceed on this train of thought and discover the different technologies which we can achieve this. Simply say, the different solar cell types. There are lots of different technologies and still new ones emerge. The solar industry is quickly developing sector with plenty of new investments and research. I won't try to cover all the solar cell technologies, just most of them, which are available today. This is a huge topic, so we need three videos to cover them. In this first one, I will talk about the basics of photovoltaic cells, some of it you already heard in the previous chapters, so this is a quick repeat. We know that one swallow doesn't do summer. It is the same with the PV cells. One emit around 1.5 volt only, and this is not enough for anything. So we can see how can we link the solar cells together to reach the desired electrical voltage and current. In the second part of the video, we will start to evaluate the different PV technologies. We start with the most common one, which is the silicon-based solar cell. On this slide, you see a basic photovoltaic system. Photovoltaic came from the words photo, meaning light and watt, a measurement of electricity. Photovoltaic electricity is obtained by using photovoltaic system utilizing the solar energy. As you see on this slide, basic photovoltaic system consists of some important components. My colleague explained this system in more detail, so I will just quickly repeat it. First in the system is the solar panel, where the solar energy is converted into electricity. Then the DC, direct current, flowing through the charge controller, which protects the battery. Most of the electrical devices uses not direct current, but alternating current EC. So the direct current has to be converted to alternating current, which is the task of the inverter. This is actually one of the most expensive parts of the system. The alternative current coming out of the inverter can be used for house applications, or if there is an excess amount of it, it can be sold and sent back into the electrical grid. Solar panel is an indispensable component of this system. It is responsible to collect solar radiation and transform it into electrical energy. Solar panel is an array of several solar cells. The arrays can be formed by connecting them in parallel or in series connection, depending upon the energy you require. We will check this in a few minutes. Once I say solar cell, once PV cells, these are actually the same. PV cells means photovoltaic cell. These cells are devices that connect solar radiation into direct current electricity. Because the source of this radiation is usually the sun, they are often referred to as solar cells. But what is a solar cell? A structure that converts solar energy directly to direct electricity energy. It supplies a voltage and the current to a resistive load. It is like a battery because it supplies DC power, but on the other hand, it is different from a battery in the sense that the voltage supplied by the cell changes with the change in the resistance of the load. And actually, individual PV cells are the basic building blocks for modules, which are in turn the building blocks for arrays and complete PV systems. 
As I said before, we will study the different type of solar systems. Nowadays, the most common solar cells are silicon based. So, this is the basic component of a most of solar cells. Do you know from where does the silicon come? You should remember from the previous video. Is it comes from the air or from the water or from the sand? It comes from the sand. So we have a very abundant source of it. On this slide, we can have a closer look to the silicon atom. As you see in the Mendeleev periodic table, its symbol is SI. It is a member of group 14 in the periodic table. Carbon is above it and germanium, tin and lead are below it. It belongs to the metalloid or semiconductor element category. Its atomic number is 14, which means it has 14 protons and the same amount of electrons. In the ground state, the electrons are arranged in different shells. As you see, two fills the first, eight the second, and four are occupying the third shell. These four outer electrons called valence electrons. According to Wikipedia, valence electron is an outer shell electron that is associated with an atom and that can participate in the formation of chemical bond in the outer shell. Is it not closed? They are important because they are involved in interactions with other atoms, as in the case of chemical bonds like covalent bonds. On the right side, you can see the crystal structure of the silicon atom. Pure silicon alone is not enough in a solar cell because pure silicon has low semiconductor value. So ordinary silicon will not help us to capture and use effectively the energy of photons coming from the sun. We will need few other elements that are close in their electronic structure to silicon, which are bore and phosphorus. As you see here, the first is the boron. It has five protons and five electrons. Two of its electrons filling the first shell, leaving three valence electrons in the outer second shell. So boron has one less valence electron than silicon. The second is phosphorus. A phosphorus atom has 15 protons and 15 electrons. Two fills the first, eight the second, and five are occupying the third shell. With five valence electrons, phosphorus has one more valence electrons than silicon. On this slide, we see the crystalline structure of the silicon containing the two elements we saw before, the poron and phosphorus as impurities. They are connected to each other by the covalent bond and forming a crystal. In the right bottom corner of the slide, you can see how. According to Wikipedia, the basic idea of the covalent bond is, if you bring two atoms close together, the valence electrons from each atom will be attracted to the positive nucleus of the other atom. Pairs of valence electrons get shared between the atoms, one from each atom. In the crystal of the phosphorus atom is called an electron donor because it donates an extra negative electron to the silicon crystal. The N type, the N, stands for negative. Because the phosphorus atom has one more proton than silicon, it has a net positive charge. A boron atom is called an electron acceptor 
because its excess amount of hole. Here, the P in the P type stands for positive hole. Because the boron atom has one less proton than silicon has, it has a net negative charge. Most PV cells are variations of silicon altered by doping to make them suitable semiconductors. Doping is the process of adding small amounts of impurity elements to semiconductors to alter their electrical properties. This we saw on the previous slide, actually. The electron donor N-type and the electron acceptor P-type are tightly attached with a so-called PN junction. Electrons and holes we were talking about can diffuse across the PN junction and recombine. The excess electrons from the left side want to fill the holes in the right side. The result is a net negative charge on the P side of the junction and the net positive charge on the N side, creating a strong electric field across the junction. The potential between the two sides are around 0.6 to 0.7 volts in a silicon PN junction. This slide can be also familiar from the previous video. Here we can quickly summarize the operation of a solar cell. At the point when protons hit the solar cell, if it has the right amount of energy, it pops free an electron. So the n-type, which is located above, has three electrons in the atomic structure, and the p-type, located below, has three spaces or holes for electrons. Therefore, when they are put together, an electrical field is produced by the free electrons in the n-type silicon going to fill the gaps in the p-type. This I said before. Then, because of the electrical field, an electron will flow between the n-type and the p-type, creating voltage, the current, and hence electrical power. The common single junction silicon solar cell can produce maximum open circuit voltage of approximately a half of watts. After we learn about the operation of solar cells, now let's see its structure. The blue and red ones are silicon layers, the N and P type layers. This we are know already. Both sides has its metallic conductors. Above them, you see the glass. The front glass sheet protects the solar cell from the weather and impact from hail or airborne debris. The glass is typically high strength tempered glass, which is three to four millimeters thick and is designed to resist mechanical loads and extreme temperature changes. This type of glass is much safer than standard glass. Below the glass is the module encapsulant. This is made from ethylene vinyl acetate, which is a specially designed polymer, highly transparent plastic layer used to encapsulate the cells and hold them in position during manufacture. The lamination either side of the PV cell provides some shock absorption and helps protect the cells and interconnecting wires from vibration and sudden impact from hailstones and other objects. The yellow one is the back sheet. The back sheet is the rearmost layer of common solar panels, which acts as a moisture barrier and final external skin to provide both mechanical protection and electrical insulation. The back sheet material is made of various polymers or plastic. The solar cells are in aluminum frame, which plays a critical role 
by both protecting the edge of the laminate section housing the cells and providing a solid structure to mount the solar panel in position. Solar cells are not usually used individually because they do not output sufficient voltage and power to meet typical electrical demands. We know already that the common single junction silicon solar cell can produce a maximum open circuit voltage of approximately 0.6 to 0.7 volts, but that is not enough for anything. The amount of voltage and current they output can be increased by combining the cells together with wires to produce larger area of solar module. Cells can be connected in a number of ways, strings, for example, where cells are connected in series, then blocks, two or more strings connected together in parallel, and finally, joining two or more blocks together. First, we check the series linking method. Individual cells are connected in series by soldering thin metal strips on the top surface negative terminal of one cell to the back surface positive terminal of the next. The modules are connected in series with other modules by connecting conductors between the negative terminal of one module to the positive terminal of another module. When individual devices are electrically connected in series, the positive connection of the whole circuit is made at the device on one end of the string and the negative connection is made at the device on the opposite end. Each cells produce a voltage of between 0.5 and 0.6 volts, so 36 cells are needed to produce an open circuit voltage of about 20 volts. This is sufficient to charge a 12 volt battery under most conditions. In series connection, the current flow is equal to the current from the cell generating the smallest current, actually limited by the poorest cell. So, serious connections increase the voltage output. The more cells are linked together, serious, the higher the emitted voltage. On this slide, you can see the parallel connections. Parallel connections are not generally used for individual PV devices, especially cells, but for series strings of cells and modules. Parallel connections involve connecting all the positive terminals of each string together and all the negative terminals together at common terminals or bus bars. In parallel connections, the voltage is the average of the cells or string in parallel. Parallel connections increase the current output. The more cells are linked together, the higher the emitted current. We saw the two connection methods. The series connections increase the voltage output and Parallel connections increase the current output. On the right side, you see highlighted what is power. In physics, power is the amount of energy transferred or converted per unit time. In the international system of unit, the unit of power is the watt, equal to one joule per second. Power is equal with the potential difference or voltage drop across the component measured in volts multiply with the current through it measured in amperes. 
but neither the voltage nor the current of one cell are enough for daily use, so somehow both has to be increased. But how? We need to use both connection types. First, the cells are connected electrically in series, one to another, to reach the desired voltage. Here on the drawing, four cells are connected in series, and then these three series are connected parallel to increase the current. As we learned, we need to connect lots of cells to reach the desired power. A module is a PV device consisting a number of individual cells connected electrically, laminated, encapsulated, and packaged into a frame. As we learned already, the PV cells are laminated within a polymer plastic substrate to hold them in place and to protect the electrical connections between them. The cell laminates are then encapsulated, sealed between a rigid packing material and a glass cover. Some thin film laminates use flexible materials such as aluminium or stainless steel substrate and polymer encapsulation instead of glass cover. Here you can see the specifications of a panel I found. As you see, a nowadays common panel or module is around two times one meters in dimensions, weighing 25 to 30 kilogram. Its power output is around 400 watt with 40 volts and 10 amperes. Do you remember? P is equal V times I. As we learned already, one cells emit 0.5 volt. So for the 40 volt output, we would need around 80 cells connected in series. In this case, the current would be not enough. In this module, there are 144 cells are connected using both series and parallel connections. But about the specifications of a system, we will talk later. The next step in the system is the array. The array is a complete PV power generating unit consisting of a number of individual electrically and mechanically integrated modules with structural supports, trackers, or other components. The term panel is also used in relation to modules and arrays. Sometimes panel is used as an alternate term for a module. More commonly, the term panel refers to an assembly of two or more modules that are mechanically and electrically integrated into a unit for easy of installation on the field. After finishing the basics, it's time for a short quiz. You can see the two types of silicon here, which is N, and which is the p-type. In the picture above, with the phosphorus impurities, you can see the n-type, and below, the p-type with the boron. In which direction does the current flow and in which direction do the electrons migrate? As you see on the drawing, the electrons and the charge flow in the opposite direction of a convectional electric current. The charge from positive to negative, the electrons from negative positive. How can be solar cells connected? In series, in parallel block connection. And the last question, 
why are cells connected and why are we using our connection types? Because the power of one cell is not enough and linking cells in series increase only the voltage and linking cells in parallel increases only the current. So we use both to increase both of them. We mentioned earlier that there are plenty of solar technologies. So after the introduction, let's see them. For this slide, you can see the most common ones, including the new technologies. Most probably, when you watch this video, there are already some new concepts. First, we will discuss the most common group, the silicon cells. This group can be further divided to crystalline and thin filled silicon cells. These also have subcategories like single and polycrystalline cells. The second big group contains the thin film technologies cells like cadmium teller and copper indium gallium with desalinity cells. And the group three to five PV cells like gallium indium phosphorus and gallium arsenic cells. And finally, the third generation solar panel cells you can see on the right side. This group is continuously expanding them, so it is impossible to evaluate all the variants in it. We will check some of them. Let's start with the first biggest group. In the next couple of minutes, I will talk about the silicon basis cells, most PV technologies that have been deployed at the commercial level have been produced using silicon with vapor based crystalline silicon. Currently, this is the most popular solar cell because it exhibits stable photoconversion efficiency and can be processed into efficient, non toxic and very reliable PV cells. Wafer-based crystalline silicon cells leverage over 50 years manufacturing experience, a vast technology base in terms of materials, established production process and device designs, far-reaching track record based on performance, longevity and reliability, as well as maximum performance of flat wave technologies with a massive database. As you see, among its advantages, silicon is very abundant. Of course, silicon cells have some disadvantages as well. These are, it requires expensive, highly pure silicon and competes for silicon with electronics industry. On this slide, you can see the types of crystalline silicon. Carefully made silicon forms crystals. Different levels of crystal structure may exist, ranging from single crystal to totally non-crystalline. The different types of silicon cells are single crystal silicon, multi or polycrystal silicon, ribbon silicon, and finally, the amorphous silicon, which is marked with green dot to indicate that actually it is a silicon based thin film technology. The main difference between each type is the crystal grain size and their growth technique. This slide shows you the two first variants. In monosilicium, the crystal lattice of the entire sample is continuous. The polysilicium is composed of many crystallized of varying size and orientation. In the left bottom corner, you can see how can you decide from appearance which is which. Because of the different producing methods, monosilicium 
cells have rounded edge and don't have a bluish speckled look. First, we learn about the monocrystalline silicon. These are the oldest technology solar cells. Monocrystalline, as its name shows, made from a pure silicon, a single large crystal, cut from ignorance. Since the monocrystalline silicon is pure and defect free, the efficiency of cell will be higher, but also this is the most expensive. Somewhat better in low light conditions, but not as good as some advertising hype would have you believe. Efficiency of these cells varies from 14 to 17 percent. Performance of these cells is not good at high temperature, but occupies significantly less volume to produce the same amount of power. These are two times more expensive when compared to thin film solar cells. These panels rank high on the charts on a lot of parameters like efficiency, power output, and their cost, since they demand a high price because of their number of positive points. As these panels are more efficient, another positive is they use much less room space to generate an amount of power. For approximately one kilowatt power output solar panel, is six to nine square meter area is required. As I mentioned before, monocrystalline is made from a pure silicon from a single large crystal. Its structure can be seen here. As it is a single continuous crystal structure, they have very few impurities in the cell. But how can you produce a big single crystal? On this slide can be seen the different single crystal growth techniques. The first is the Totsralski growth method. Most single crystal silicon made this way. It produces lower quality silicon than flat sod method. It is an advantage that it is cheaper production than the flat sod and it produces cylinders and circular walkers. The other method is the flat zone method. It has better quality than CZ, but it is more expensive than CZ. It produces also cylinders and circular vapors. Let's see first the CZ crude method. The pure silicon is melted in a quartz cubicle under vacuum or inert gas and the seed crystal is dipped into the mat. The seed crystal is slowly drawn and slowly rotated, so the molten silicon crystallizes to the seed rock candy. The mat temperature, rotation rate, and the pull rate are controlled to create an ignore of a certain diameter. Over a period of many hours, the seed crystal grows into a large cylindrical crystal up to 40 inch in length and 8 inch in diameter. Because of the ignotus round, the edges are often cropped to a more rectangular or square shape, which allows cells to be packed more closely in a module, but we will see it a bit later. Here below you can see the whole process from left to right. First, the silicon, which contains some impurities, is matted. This dirt is dissolving and it remains a pure silicon. You can see the seed, the building ignot, and finally, on the left side, the finished ignot as one big the second method is the flat zone method. Here, the final ignot is produced by cylindrical polysilicon rod that already has a seed crystal in its lower end. As you see on the picture, an encircling inductive heating coil 
mass the silicon material. The coil heater starts from the bottom and is raised, pulling up the molten zone. A solidified single crystal ignot forms below. Impurities prefer to remain in the molten silicon, so very few defects and impurities remain in a forming crystal. After the building of ignots, they are cut into thin wafers or solar cells. There are two techniques for this, wire sewing and diamond blade sewing. Both produces around 20% waste from care losses, silicon sodas. The ignot is hard, so the slicing is time consuming and dirty and requires water for cooling. But finally, there are silicon wafers for the solar cells. Now we will see the polycrystalline or multicrystalline solar cells panels. It is distinctly different from the monosolar panel in its appearance. The polycrystalline solar panels have a bluish back look, a non-uniform texture due to the visible crystal grain, and unlike the monopanels, the cells have square edges. Apart from the appearance, the processing method is also different. Polycrystalline modules are composed of a number of different crystals fused together to make a single cell. Polycrystalline is basically cast blocks of silicon which may contain various crystalline sizes. Hence, the efficiency of this type of cell is less than monocrystalline cell. Let's see some features of it. This is probably the most common type right now on the market. Because of the square cuts, I mean the corners are not chopped down, the wasted surface area is less than by the monocrystalline version. The polycrystalline cells have slightly lower efficiencies, 11 to 14 percent, than monocrystalline cells. They're Tensor packing in modules make them competitive with monocrystalline modules. In the residential solar system market, polycrystalline solar panels are cheaper, the processing is faster, and therefore have a market price advantage. Crystalline cells, mono and poly as well, generally have a longer lifetime than the amorphous variety. On this slide, you can see the structure of the polycrystal. The regions of the three single crystalline silicon is separated by growing boundaries with irregular bonds. Polycrystalline panels are made using a completely different method than the monocrystalline panels. In the manufacturing process of polycrystalline cells, Liquid silicon is used as a raw material. In a rectangular vat, it is allowed to cool down. This cooling down process is slow, lasts over several hours. During this, the impurities drift to the edges, which cool last. The edges are sewn or acid etched off. During cooling, many silicon crystals form and grow as the molten material solidifies. And finally, the cast ignotes is then sectioned with wire saws to form square or rectangular wafers. The next and the last type is the ribbon silicon. It is a technique used to grow multi-crystalline silicon. The silicon is molded in a cubicle as you see on this drawing. Two graphite filaments are placed into it and pulled out slowly. The molten silicon is growing horizontally through capillary action along the filaments. It produces a ribbon-like sheet of multicrystalline silicon, which is already a long wrapper. So there are no care losses. 
of all types of panels, this has also pros and cons. Let's see them. First, the advantages. Its thickness can be varied easily by the filament width and the pull speed. It is cheaper than the two earlier discussed methods because of less wasted silicon due to sawing buffers. These advantages are lower solar cell efficiencies due to more defects, the irregular surface characteristic leading to poorer cell performance. Today, we were learning about the basics of photovoltaic cells. How is getting from PV cells to solar panel? And we started to evaluate the different types of PV technologies with the crystalline silicon cells, single crystal, polycrystal silicon, and the ribbon silicon. So with three quick questions, let's see how do you remember? Mono or polycrystalline cells are better? Because ribbon silicon is a kind of polycrystalline type, so it is enough if you decide mono or poly. Let's see. Price point. The polycrystalline is better. Lifespan. Single crystal silicon is better. And efficiency. Of course, also single crystal silicon is the better. As I mentioned before, there are plenty of different solar cell types. In the next few videos, we will see the residue. The thin film technology, group three to five PV cells, third generation solar panels, and some solar panel specifications. Thanks for watching. Bye.